Well, good morning, and thank you all for joining us this morning for uh, the Mojave Desert Air Quality Management District's annual Community Air Protection Program meeting. This is a community meeting, and we are glad to have uh, so many members of the community, uh, not only here in the high desert, but also in the Palo Verde Valley and elsewhere throughout our jurisdiction joining us. Uh, we appreciate your attendance. We appreciate your interest as we talk this morning about uh, AB 617 and the Community Air Protection Program. Um, we still have some people coming into the room, um, but as, as they do, I wanted to say right off the bat, um, before we do anything else this morning, uh, that we are only talking this morning about AB 617 and the Community Air Protection Program. That is very specific. So as we go through our presentation this morning, and you'll hear from a few, um, a few of our team members in a few minutes here, uh, as we go through our presentation, we will be talking about things, uh, excuse me, about projects uh, or potential projects for consideration under the Community Air Protection Program. So again, this meeting is specifically and purely for the Community Air Protection Program and AB 617. We will not be discussing any other topics as we go throughout uh, our meeting this morning. Uh, if you have inform if you have questions about other um, MDA QMD related issues, uh, please feel free to reach out to me. My name is Marshall Haprov. I am the communications analyst. Um, you can ask me uh, by, by email. You can find my contact information uh, on our website, as well as in just a, a moment once I turn it over, turn this meeting over uh, to our next speaker. Uh, I will put my contact information directly in the chat box. Uh, so use that information if you have questions that do not pertain this morning to AB 617 and the Community Air Protection Program and the various points that we will discuss during this meeting. Uh, so uh, one more uh, quick uh, note of housekeeping. Um, all of the projects that we will discuss this morning, as well as projects uh, that we can consider uh, for uh, uh, future projects, for future efforts, um, have to fall within our jurisdiction. And you should be able to see right now on your screen, our jurisdiction um, is, is quite sizable, actually. Uh, it, it's just a little more than 20,000 square miles. We're the second largest uh, air district in the state of California uh, by land mass. Uh, we cover all of the desert portion of San Bernardino County. So that's uh, just about everything uh, north and, and east of the Cajon Pass. Uh, as well as um, a, a large part of the Morongo Basin and uh, the Palo Verde Valley in Riverside County. So if a project or a potential project falls outside of those boundaries, uh, we, we will not discuss that project or cannot take that project into consideration. That would have to go to the Air District with that jurisdictional authority. Uh, so if you have a project for um, for, for pitch, uh, for consideration that you'd like to share uh, with our crew this morning uh, when, and with others on the, the meeting. Uh, it, just remember, it needs to fall within those boundaries that you see on the screen. And if at any point you have questions uh, about a community that may or may not be included in our jurisdiction, again, you can use the chat. If you have any other questions, uh, again, as they relate specifically to the Community Air Protection Program, please use the chat function. Uh, you can find that if you're using a desktop or a laptop, you can find that uh, at the bottom of your screen, you click on the chat and it'll open up a separate window. Um, I, we would ask that you direct questions uh, for our presenters this morning, that you direct those questions using the chat box directly to me. Again, my name is Marshall Haprov. I am the communications analyst. Uh, we also have joining us this morning, our grant specialist, Trung Tran. Uh, he is on the, on the call. He will, be join he will be speaking in a little bit. Uh, we have joining us our Deputy Air Pollution Control Officer, Alan DeSalvio. Uh, you'll be hearing from him in a few moments, uh, but before we get to Alan, uh, let me introduce to you our Support Services Supervisor, Jorge Camacho. Jorge, feel free to take it away. Hi, Marshall. Thanks for that. Um, can we get to the next slide? Um, good morning, everybody, and thank you for sharing your breakfast or brunch hour with us, and some of you may be lunch, and if it is, you know, more power to you. Um, just to let you know, this is our third virtual community workshop as it pertains to AB 617 or the Community Air Protection Program. I did want to give you a little bit of background on the legislation itself. It was authored by Assemblywoman Christina Garcia and passed by the legislator, 
legislator back in back into law in 2017. This piece of law directed our state oversight uh, agency, the California Air Resources Board, which you will see abbreviated as CARB during our presentation, to establish the Community Air Protection Program, or you may hear it referred to as the CAP program or just CAP in general. The focus of the CAP program was to reduce exposures in communities that were most impacted, impacted or most burdened by pollution and cumulative, and cumulative exposure in their community. In addition, CARB also selected various communities throughout the state that will have to take further steps and support the 617. In the next few slides, we're going to address the goals of AB 617 at the state level. Then we will move on to the action the district has completed in support of the goals of, of AB 617 or CAP. So one thing to remember about the CAP program that CARB wanted to acknowledge, they wanted this to be a focus on community action, and they address um, six issues that they believe needed to be addressed in order to meet these goals. The first one was community level air quality, air quality monitoring, community emissions reductions program, accelerated retrofit of pollution controls on industrial facilities, enhanced emission reporting on requirements, increased penalty provisions for polluters, and lastly, grants to local community groups if applicable. Once CARB identified the six main areas for community action, then they created program elements to address the main areas. The program elements were monitoring, emissions, funding, and emissions reduction. Within each program element, there were objectives to be achieved at the state and in some cases, the local level. For example, within the monitoring element, there were directives to establish community air, air monitoring networks. You'll learn more about the purple or sensors later in the presentation. Within the funding element, the state provided an incentive funds for eligible organizations to purchase new and cleaner engine technology. And lastly, the emission reduction program element, where the director worked on a BARC implementation schedule for applicable facility and BARC stands for best available retrofit control technology. And you will learn more about that later in the presentation. The other implementation elements, elements that CARB developed, such as the technology clearinghouse, in this element, the state and local agencies will look at additional emission control technology for stationary, area-wide, and mobile sources, emission reporting, where the state wanted to create annual reporting for specific facilities and develop uniform methodologies for reporting, and lastly, a resource center to provide the organization with best practices information as well as educational information on emissions and outreach tools. At 617 or CAP, it's still a new and evolving program. CARB is continually seeking input from stakeholders on how, on how they can improve their program or other areas to consider. This slide has a link to CARB 617 page where you can email them directly and you have the ability to subscribe for updates on the program. If you have not done so, I would encourage everyone on today's calls to visit the website, provide feedback, or at least sign up to your mailing list so you can get information on the current 617 program. Now, for now, on our next slide, I'm going to kick it over to our Deputy Air Pollution Control Officer, and he's going to tell you more about the action the district has taken in support of the goals of the CAP program. Thanks, Jorge. As Jorge mentioned, the AB 617 had a specific requirement to adopt best available retrofit control technology rules for specific sources, those sources subject to CAP and trade. In the case of the Mojave Desert AQMD, that meant three facilities, well, four facilities, three cement kiln facilities, and one chemical milling facility in Trona. The Mojave Desert AQMD adopted those rules as required by AB 617. We adopted a amendment to Rule 1161, our Portland Cement Kiln Rule, in 2018, which implemented BART as defined by the state of California. And we then subsequently adopted a new rule, 1157.1, uh, which implemented barked requirements for boilers outside the federal ozone non-attainment area, which specifically included those boilers subject to the cabin trade program in the Trona area, currently operated by Searles Valley Minerals. I used an acronym FONA, that means the federal ozone non-attainment area, it's that portion of the district which is not meeting the national ambient air quality standards for ozone, but it, it really has no bearing on 
AB 617, AB 617 applies throughout the district. It's just, we have a rule 1157 that applies within the FONA and 1157.1 applies outside the FONA, meeting the backed requirement. In addition, the while the Mojave Desert AQMD does not have any communities identified specifically under AB 617, we do believe that it's that community sensors are a, an important method to meet the requirements of AB 617. And so the district has, has made a major effort to install, purchase and install purple air community sensors, which, uh, which monitor or are sensors for fine particulate, PM1 and PM2.5 with an interpolated value for PM10. We have attempted to put those throughout the district, at least places where we can put them. And this map shows where they are. There's, as you can see, the, the green boxes are scattered throughout the district. Uh, there's a few areas that are essentially unpopulated, which have no monitors, but we have them uh, throughout areas with population. Most recently, we put a couple in Hinkley and uh, a few more in the, in the uh, Victorville area, I believe. So those were funded partially with 617 revenues. I think I'm handing it back to Jorge. Thanks, Jorge. Hey, Alan, thanks for that information. And also to clarify the, uh, the purple air sensors, if you want to get, uh, if you go to our website, you can actually get real-time data on those purple air sensors as well. I believe, Marshall, if you can, if you can put the link into the chat box in case somebody wants it, and that way you can actually see the sensors in action as well. Now, as I mentioned earlier during our presentation, um, CAP, the CAP program has a focus on community participation, and one of the keys is gathering community feedback. The district has, had, has held several meetings with stakeholders over the past three years. As I mentioned earlier during the meeting, this is going to be our third virtual meeting. In the previous meetings, the community supported funding zero emission equipment when possible with an emphasis on clean transportation for children. Next slide. Mm -hmm. In addition to the outreach, the district had also created a community air protection program webpage. On this page, you can find information on past meetings, a list of completed projects and projects that are in progress, and other documents showing the action the district has taken in support of 617. And also, just to know, um, even if you do miss these meetings, we are continuously seeking input from stakeholders. On this same page, there is a survey that anyone can complete, as well as our contact information. If anyone had any additional questions or any feedback, we're always willing and open to accepting that feedback. Marshall, as far as our current page, our outreach page, is there anything else you would like to add concerning that, or did I hit all the points? <laughs> you hit it. We're good. Next slide. One of the other elements on 617 was incentive funding that was provided to districts to fund emission reducing projects in areas most impacted by air pollution. Um, to be clear, there is a strict eligibility criteria in order to be eligible for the fund. In general, the district receives about a million dollars in incentive funds to provide financial incentives to both public and private sectors to reduce emission by retiring, by retiring and replacing older equipment with newer, cleaner engine technology and prioritizing zero emission technology and infrastructure when possible. I do wanna hit the key here that it's for private and public. So don't think these funds are just for a public entity or private. So make sure that even if you operate your own independent business, you still would be eligible for these funds as long as you meet the eligibility criteria. Now, building on feedback from the community, uh, one of the first projects the district did was 617 was partnered with Northwest Pipe Company located in Adelanto. In this particular project, the district funded to replace six old industrial forklifts with two, near, two new tier four for, forklifts. This was a new unique process at the district as the grantee, excuse me, I'm getting caught up in my words here, destroyed several pieces of equipment to get a newer equipment. Now, I did mention tier four earlier in this slide. A tier four engine is just the cleaning, the cleanest diesel engine available technology that we have currently available. It's a, it's a tier four engine significantly reducing emissions of particulate matter and oxides of nitrogen to near zero emission level. So the fact that they upgraded to tier four, completely great. Next slide. <laughs> So building on feedback from the community as well, the district partnered with local school districts. The three school districts were the Lucerne Valley, Apple Valley, 
and the Alamanto School District. For all three schools, the district provided funding to help purchase zero emission all electric school buses and also provided grant funding to help purchase the charging station for the buses. What was unique for these projects, the district was able to provide in some cases up to 100% funding for these buses at no cost to the district, which I think was an awesome opportunity for the districts to try out this new technology at no cost to them. In addition, we also connected some of these districts with Edison as far as their program. They have a charge ready program, which helps school district upgrade their infrastructure needed to support the zero emission buses. As of now, we have um, we have funded six total buses for the school districts, three for Adelanto, two for Apple Valley, and one for Lucerne Valley. And as I mentioned, Marcia, can you go back to the previous slide? I think I may have jumped ahead here. <laughs> so we also partnered with local district and we also provided funding for some of these chargers. Um, and from this slide, you can see the charger from the Apple Valley Unified School District, the one in the middle from Ave Alanto, and the one on the right from Lucerne Valley. They're different depending on the type of chargers each one needed for their infrastructure and also what their infrastructure can support at the time. Next slide, please. <laughs> Now I'm going to kick it over to our grant specialist, Trung, and he's going to provide more information on the additional uh, outreach event that the district had attended in support of the CAP. All right, thank you, Jorge. Uh, once again, my name is Trung, and I'm the grant specialist. Um, so back in June 8, 2022, me and my po uh, colleague, Ralph Lubin, attended a zero emission truck showcase. Um, there, there was about 500 fleet owners and operators, policymakers, and industry professionals came out to test drive a wide range of zero emission trucks uh, that are available for purchase or deployment. Um, the uh, class A vehicles, which are your semi vehicles, your big rigs, or your wheelers, we also learned about um, EV infrastructure. Now, with EV infrastructure, like Jorge stated earlier, there's different type of infrastructures. Some are level two and some are fast charging infrastructures. So for those that are interested in um, getting an infrastructure for your home or to class A vehicles, you should partner up with your local ele uh, electricity, such as Edison, to learn more about that. And then we also learn about funding opportunities, which on this slide here, um, in addition to our local AB 617, our district also tried to um, get more information, more incentives. Um, with this event, we, were, we learned about that there is about 35 million in incentive vouchers available through California's hybrid and zero emission truck and bus voucher incentive project, which is HVIP. Um, Marshall, can you put down the link for everyone to know? Um, Thank you. And you could go on to the next slide. And then for uh, our proposed future project, as Jorge stated earlier, we are working for multiple school districts um, in our jurisdiction. And uh, this year we're, we're planning to fund, help fund three to four diesel school buses for Adelant Elementary School District and Lucerne Valley uh, School District. We also work with their, the school districts on zero emission lawn and garden equipment for minutes. And um, upcoming year, we're working with the landscaping organizations to incentive zero emission commercial lawn and garden equipment. And uh, I'll bring it back to Marshall. Hi, uh, thanks, Trung. Thanks for that information. And thanks for getting information on the zero emissions truck showcase. So now uh, we reached the end of our presentation and before um, Marshall starts um, speaking and um, handling some of the questions, I do wanna address that as far as feedback, if the community still supports, you know, zero emission school buses and clean transportation for children, that's the direction the district wants to go. If you wanna add additional directions, please let us know. We definitely wanna have this an open dialogue and open conversation. And we do wanna address any questions or um, any need the community may have. Marshall? <laughs> As of right now, I don't have any uh, further quest questions. I will uh, redirect people uh, once again, everyone to the chat box. Um, if you do have any questions, 
um, please, we'll we'll give you give you a couple minutes here if you want to uh, throw any questions into the chat box so we can address them before we're done with our presentation this morning. I also wanted to remind everyone um, we did put the link or links uh, to the real time purple air uh, map. So that that shows you um, like just like it suggests in real time uh, particulate measurements uh, in any given community. Now it is it is important to point out. Um, that we do not use uh, any readings from these uh, low cost sensors uh, for official uh, for official purposes, so we don't don't report these numbers uh, as well as we don't utilize these numbers to uh, inform us for cases of air quality or smoke advisories. Uh, so we uh, because these are not federally regulated uh, we can't we actually can't use them in that sense. Uh, but they generally will give you and us an idea of uh, particulate levels in a in a neighborhood while they might we may not be able to use them on an official level uh, we can certainly see uh, if there is an increase or a decrease um, in the case of a, a smoke event for example um, so if if you are so inclined uh, i would suggest bookmarking um, that page as it will give you uh, again, a better idea of an overall sense of particulate levels. These sensors uh, only measure um, PM10 and PM2.5. Uh, they don't measure ground level ozone. Uh, so, um, for any other purposes, including if you're if you're interested in uh, perhaps you know uh, what might be what might be going on in any particular day, you know, let's say we have a wildfire smoke event, I encourage you to follow us on social media. Uh, we, you can find us on Facebook, you can find us on Twitter. Um, we post the, those pieces of information there first. Uh, so I would encourage you to follow us on social media as well as information like uh, invites to this very um, community meeting that we host annually. Uh, we also uh, have a newsletter and an email list, a distribution list. Uh, you can find that if you're not already on it, you can find that by just going to our website. Uh, which is mdaqmd.ca.gov, and I will throw that into the chat in a minute here. Um, if, as soon as you go to that homepage, if you're not already on our mailing list, it should come up with a, a pop-up window that um, invites you to sign up for that. Uh, so things like today's community meeting, uh, smoke advisories, air quality advisories, and other news releases, uh, we post those uh, again to our social media as well as send those out to our distribution list. Uh, so if you're not already on that, um, I would encourage you to sign up for that. Um, we did have uh, a question in the chat. However, as I said at the beginning of this meeting, uh, we were only going to talk uh, in this meeting about um, issues that pertain directly to the Community Air Protection Program authorized under AB 617, which was signed into legislation uh, in 2017. Uh, so um, any other questions uh, that you have that don't relate to AB 617 or the Community Air Protection Program, uh, I would encourage you once again to utilize uh, the contact information I provided for myself. I am Marshall Haprov, the communications analyst. Uh, that contact information is there in the chat, uh, my email address, as well as my desk number. Uh, so we do have a question here. Um, I'm Alan, this may be best for you to answer, but I'll, I'll open it up. Uh, sure. does, does MDA QMD also support the use of clean renewable fuels that are immediately that are available for use immediately, like renewable diesel R99. It is available now and no infrastructure changes are required. It is a quote, drop in unquote fuel. CARB notes that it cuts greenhouse gas emissions by 80%. Yeah, the greenhouse gas reductions or other requirements are not within our purview. That's at the state level only. And because renewable diesel is a drop in, it's just like any other uh, diesel fuel, biodiesel or other, other drop in fuel. It makes no difference to the district. Certainly we support any use of uh, renewable or a fuel that re results in less emissions, but it's not a, there's no mandate or requirement for that, that renewable fuel or any other. So what, you know, we certainly support it. It's legal to be used in, in equipment that we permit as diesel. Hopefully that answers that question. Yep, I think that works. All right. Well, that that was the only other question I had here um, as it relates to our presentation today. Uh, so I want to let you know uh, that this the recording of today's meeting uh, will be available 
uh, on our YouTube page and we will link that video from our YouTube page to our social media accounts as well as the uh, Community Air Protection Program or AB 617 page on our website. So if you go to our website mdaqmd.ca.gov and you go up to the outreach menu, you will see an option for Community Air Protection Program AB 617. That is where we provide updates to our efforts under AB 617, just like invites to this community meeting today and uh, the recording from today's meeting will be on that page later. Uh, so look, look for it there uh, as well as feel free to share that video, this video and the PowerPoint, which will link right under the video. Feel free to share that with uh, other members of the community, um, other potential stakeholders and those who might have uh, an interest in projects or future projects for consideration under AB 617. Um, that is all I have, uh, unless anyone else uh, has any other questions or information to share. Uh, we will say thank you again for joining us. Uh, nice and short meeting. Jorge, did you have anything to add? Um, yeah, I put something in the chat. Thank you, Marshall. Um, to be clear, the district will continue to fund clean transportation for children and other emission reducing projects. This is kind of the direction that's always been. Um, and I'm assuming since I heard no, nothing against it, we're still going to move forward with that. However, as I mentioned, we are still always accepting um, other feedback and suggestion and Marshall provided all those avenues of how you can provide that feedback and information. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, if there are no further questions, uh, we'll say thank you for joining us and we'll see you soon. Thank you.